Welcome to episode 10 of season 2. I'm Robbie Dodd. I'm joined by my co-host of Ed's Not Dead, Mr. Casey Siddons. Okay, hello. What's up, man? Nothing. How are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you, brother. Yeah. And of course, Mr. Peter Crable. Here <laughs> Very nice. It's great to be back. Yeah. we got a great show tonight. Uh, you can find me at RW Dodd on Twitter, Mr. Sids. At CH Siddons. At Peter Crable. All right, boys. It's good to be back. We've got three or four great shows. Oh, man. We got in, in order. Heavy hitters up. lined up. <laughs> Lots of good stuff. Heavy hitters. And it's all because of you two. I've contributed. I'm giving that props to Crable on this one. Yeah. I, I took a back seat because of yeah. busy, busy, busy. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Crable's like working at like three in the morning. He is. It's amazing. Though. I guests. mean, like you said, like, you know, I didn't believe you, but you just send these people emails and they sure. say yes. Yeah, I, I just have to, I just have you to lull get, them into a false sense of security. I have to security. get to the actually sending the email first. I can't <laughs> it's, do that It's part. step one. I it's know. pretty important. <laughs> All right. Well, to that point, the great guest that we have coming up tonight on episode 10, uh, we're going to revisit our old friend from season one, Dead Fish Rama Manual. That's right. As Sean Hannity calls him. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna we're gonna read a, get into an article in the Atlantic about um, his reflection on all that he learned about school reform, his epiphanies that he's had now that he's out of it. There's some good stuff. How convenient! In, yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know it is. It's a little rambling. It's nice. Bit. It is. Yeah. I had to go back in to find like the the prime points. Yeah, his summary good, didn't really summarize. No, it was all over the place. But it's a good piece it because is. it touches on some some some, some good points. Some good points yes. about school. Is reform. it a mea culpa? We can no, talk it's about a it. mea, it's a it. mea culpa, and then it's a I'm really great at the end. <laughs> I'm still great, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Remember when I was great and I said the opposite? Well, I'm still yeah. great, but now I changed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, excitedly, we have the great, the one and only John Safir, yes, the founder and CEO of Research for Better Teaching, where we all worship at the John John Safir altar. That's right. Um, so he has had a profound impact yes. on all three of us, yes. on all three of us as yeah. educators. Yeah. Exactly. So we're, we're excited to have John and then we're going to end the show with Casey's cash cab. Yeah. The blue light challenge. The blue oh. light challenge is going to be a good Not one. Not to be confused with blue light special. Yeah. Which is, I don't quite qualify. Okay. I don't know yet. what a blue light special is. Know what that is. Is it an old person thing? It's an old person. Oh, thing. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so let's, let's jump right in fellas. Casey yeah. show feedback, show feedback. Uh, Mr. Cause, who is, I think, mentioned on this show every time we record, uh, because he's an avid listener. He's one of our, he's a, he was one of the original friends of the pod. That's right. Uh, yes, he, he reached out, because I have a tweet that goes out every now and then that tries to solicit ideas for new shows, and he always has some good ideas, and uh, he put out a tweet that asked some folks he knows on Twitter, some heavy hitter Twitter users, that rhymed, um, about going gradeless, about doing an episode about going gradeless, which we've kind of talked about with Rick Wormley, but not as in depth as maybe he would like to talk about. Mm-hmm. And so he connected us with Adam Lester, Jeffrey Frieden, Aaron Blackwelder, and Monty Siri. I, I apologize if I didn't say those names correctly. About going gradeless, they're interested in coming on the show and yeah, talking they, about they, how um, they've done it. They all were all in on Twitter. Yeah, 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 yeah. they were they were psyched about Very it. Very exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought we could do a, a roundtable discussion with them and just kind of have everybody talk at the same time and see what happens. Let, let's do it. Yeah. Be uh, like CNN. Be it'll be like a CNN March. talking heads. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do, a, we'll do a split screen. Ooh. Yeah. Is everybody going to be on the same Go Gradeless team? Will we have any any dissent whatsoever? Yeah. I'll do a lot of naysayer research. Okay, good. No, this yeah. is Fox right. News. We're, we're going all okay. one way. All right. Yeah, go. Got it. Um, I neglected to... to pump some of our other guests coming up yes please do pump away to your to your uh greatness mr craig oh, we oh, we have wow. again the one and only charlotte danielson that's right coming on a future show which we're incredibly excited she she's up there with john Safir as far as influence on teaching and learning and teacher evaluation over the last 30 years a yep. true thought leader mm-hmm. and true game thought changer leader. in terms yep. of how teachers are Yep. Observed and evaluated. A right. thought leader before Twitter was Twitter. I know. Yep. So how did people know about her? I don't know. And then... Reading. The advocate for teachers, yes. if there is one, yes. uh, Randy Weingarten. Yeah. So the president of American Federation of Teachers. So we are psyched about all three guests. John Safir, Charlotte Danielson, and Randy Weingarten. So folks, don't... You have to listen to Ed. Every Dad. single episode. You have to listen. Tune in. Or you're going to miss the education show that has the best thought leader guests in the business. Ever. All right. Yeah. All right. So you ready to ju- you ready to jump in? 
Yeah, to, let's do it. To the article? Please do. Okay, so the title of it is, I used to preach the gospel of education reform, then I became the mayor. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, you wanna, if we want to just take five seconds um, to revisit Rom's background, yeah. uh, he is a passionate politician. Got to give him credit for that. And, I, and most of all, I give him credit for that education was a cornerstone of his efforts to lead Chicago as the mayor. Prior to that, he was the chief of staff for President Obama. Um, so he, he reflects in this article, in this op-ed, about the kind of approach, philosophy he had about ed reform, which, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, was really mostly about teacher accountability going in. How do we hold teachers accountable to get better outcomes from kids in underperforming schools? That that's about that's about it. Yeah, I mean, he, in his intro, it says expand charter schools, which he doesn't really focus on at all. And this right. is focus relentlessly on high school graduation rates, right. which again he goes into a little bit, but I think mostly it's that first one. Yeah, it's hold it's, teachers accountable absolutely for educational gains, right, right. solve our our woes in the neighborhoods, right. Right. and and you know my term for that is that. That coercive accountability. That's right. I think he espoused that. I think I think they wanted to find ways to get rid of the teachers that weren't any good in Chicago. It was that lowest common, common denominator approach to school reform. Well, lo and behold, after it's all over, now Mr. Emanuel has had an epiphany, and he realizes that there were some things that they did along the way that he wasn't totally conscious of at the time that he now looks back and thinks these were the keys to successful reform in Chicago. And, and to be fair, last season, we did a big piece on Dr. Reardon from Stanford's research Mm -hmm. on how Chicago has added significant value in terms of years of learning, um, compared to some other more affluent school systems across the country. Right. Yeah. Remember Dr. Reardon's Mm -hmm. piece? Uh, You had a blank look on your face. No. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is some truth. There's some, there's some truth to what he's talking about, about the outcomes they got. So he basically got to the place where his thoughts really came down to that principal leadership was the fulcrum for effective uh, school reform Mm. and that charter schools weren't quite as important as you mentioned, Crabe's graduation rate was overrated. Mm Mm-hmm. And that wraparound services were key. Mm-hmm. Um, but his, his, his lead really is that principals make all the difference. And he had that epiphany as he was wrangling with the union about the role principals got to play and the amount of autonomy they had in Chicago schools. So my question to you is, is Rom right here with his epiphany about principal leadership and the role it plays in school reform? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, and when you, when you sit back and think about it, it is, it is, it's almost stunning the lack of, um, attention, I guess, paid to school leaders, principals, administrators, just whatever. I'm just, we'll just say principals, but just school leadership in general. I mean, essentially no attention has been paid to that. Um, so yeah, I think he is right up the, you know, he's barking up the right tree or some other expression. I'll even go so far as to say <laughs> principals are more important than teachers wow. in terms of determining Take a school's that, success. City on. Boom. <laughs> that's what the research says. <laughs> you don't have to go out on a limb. The, re- uh, the yeah, governance that's a, matters that's a, and leadership yeah, matters. That's a com- I feel like that's a controversial statement. Go into a room full of teachers and tell them that the role of the principal is is has a greater outcome on a school's success than an individual teacher mm. and uh, see the results. It would be controversial, but from the research that I've read is that the leadership of a school and the the teacher leadership of a school is is incredibly important for ultimately student outcomes and teacher performance. Yeah. So, I mean, my heart says that teachers are the most important piece of a school, but the research says that the, the leadership and the effective leadership of a principal um, goes a lot further exponentially in terms of outcomes so the question i guess then becomes why so why have we not talked about this why have we not put the effort on it why has all of the effort been focused on teachers in terms of education reform or school turnaround or you know whatever term well i think he uses a key word in there when when he talks about culture 
And um, I, I don't know if there's anyone more responsible for for creating the conditions of a strong culture where teachers can thrive than the principal. Yeah, the principal's daily impact in the classroom on instruction. I mean, that's debatable, but certainly the the principal's role in in creating psychological safety for people to flourish for um managing the flow of information so people have everything they need and resources all of those things are vital um and and a school's not going to thrive if you don't have what someone effective doing that um you might have good teachers in classrooms but i i think kind of the overall net effect is not going to be as what it should be without a without a, an effective principal so I was just thinking as you were talking. So last year for the the blog, I wrote this piece called The Joy of Teaching. And essentially the premise was, um, it was right at the end of the basketball season. The Warriors had just won. Steph Curry's so great, blah, 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 blah. So I did a little reading on it. And the they talk a lot about Steph Curry and his infectiousness in terms of joviality and positiveness and yeah all around good dude, fun times. And so the premise of the piece is that you need to find your, your Steph Curry, mm-hmm. right? It's not the coach. It's not the GM that everybody else, like in this analogy, all the players are the teachers, you know, the coach is the uh, principal, let's just say. So on the day to day basis, when things get tough, they don't go to the coach, they go to each other. Yeah. And so I guess the, you know, I'm, I'm arguing against my original point was that, well, you know, what if you do just have a lot of great teachers or one great teacher that kind of sets the tone for for everyone? Is that enough to to overcome? Maybe not a bad principal, but maybe a kind of mediocre blah type principal leader. Or do you still need somebody in that role of principal that is that can like create the conditions for somebody like Steph Curry to to be successful? I think I think you got to have the conditions for people to thrive. That's that's. It's really tough for anybody. And teachers look, I mean, what do teachers always cite as important to them? The, the, the leadership of their school. Right. They always, they, yeah. they, they place a tremendous amount of value. And it may not be because X principal made me a better teacher, but it certainly is because um, that that person has influenced my job in a positive way mm-hmm. or, the, or the work that I get to do. So, I mean, I don't know, to, to, to take the, the overall sports analogy a little further is it tom brady or is it bill belichick right. i mean i think it's it's tough to tell i think they're both they're both critical i i think the to me the bigger question is i mean it's a little embarrassing that that rom just figured out that principles were important as, <laughs> as a principle but i think the bigger question to me is is how much autonomy does a principal have mm. Because that that's really what school systems struggle with, especially in reform environments. Do you do you tightly couple the principal to the school system where the principal has very little autonomy and most decisions are controlled in some way? Or um, And that was his point. In Chicago right. it was they didn't really get to hire who they wanted. It was from a very tightly controlled system right. of Which is not unusual though. No, it's not no, unusual, I, but it also yeah. if you have a t- principal that doesn't have autonomy you can imagine that the teachers probably don't have autonomy. Yeah. Right? Probably. They're living in a micromanaged environment, environment. because yep. that's what yep. their principal's working under. So. Yeah, and I think what he's saying, too, is there's always this inclination on the part of institutions or organizations when there needs to be progress. You you, you manage more tightly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's saying there needed to be progress, but we stepped back and we invested in their professional development. We provided support. And then we said, go do it. Do you think... It's also easier to vilify or to be very positive towards teachers. Like as a group, you're saying, well, I know that most of them are great, but these, you know, there's a core of, there's there's dead weight. And we need to figure that out because we can evaluate them and get them out Mm -hmm. because they have direct contact with children. But then that takes away the the role of the principal in, in supporting their teachers in the way that they know how in their particular community. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't have a, a main point with that. I just think it's, it's an easier way to, to say that something's not working by talking about the teachers. Oh, I agree. And I think, I, you know, I think Rom, sorry, Peter, but I, I think Rom 
played an unfortunate role in the vilification of teachers during that era. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. we've had he this dangled discussion. out money to get rid of a- teachers. A- Essentially, that was at the heart of yeah, and Race then, to the Top. And then charters as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there was this sense for from teachers that they were under attack. Yeah. Um, I know, I know that I think Randy Weingarten would tell us that. Yeah. Um, so now he's kind of like, my bad. <laughs> what about, what about you, you? So you're both in school leadership capacities. This is a, just something I'm thinking about. Rom mayor mm-hmm. in a management position, leadership mm-hmm. position, mm-hmm. empathizes with other leaders, mm-hmm. doesn't want to attack principals who are also in a similar position of power, mm-hmm. uh, you know, dynamics. You're, you know the challenges of leadership, you know the power of leadership, and maybe you're willing to take their side on, on because of that. Oh, you are you're, similar you're, dynamic. You're really, you're really playing up the 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 shop floor versus the. I'm just saying man, just man, the, management. No, seriously, I don't I mean, know. Is there, I, I, is there any truth to that? I, I don't know. I, well, I can only we speak, know what he's I, thinking. I can only speak for myself. While maybe principals have not been under the microscope in this course of accountability since No Child Left Behind, I can tell you that many many principals that have taken on high risk, high reward school settings feel a tremendous amount of pressure yeah. to be successful. Yeah, you know, I understand and, that. And, I understand And, and bear a, a major burden in the in the reform or the turnaround of a school. I think his point was just more in in the looking at Rom as kind of a, a self interested just being defensive cre- <laughs> creature that maybe there is a little bit of self defense in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think when I, I, I became department legit. chair I lost a little bit of my feeling bad for <laughs> you and your microphone. You get it such together. Jeez. <laughs> It's okay. You both okay. had opportunities to help me, uh, yeah. and neither one of you. Well, did. I gave some good pointers, though. You really did not. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna help you at but, the break. We'll, we'll just it's okay. Anyway, just keep we'll, talking. Okay. Yeah. What I was gonna say was, um, you know, I I wonder. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> if, <laughs> Sorry. Is uh, if, see, totally lose our chance. Yeah. No. Well, you deserve. But it. is it? Uh, can you have the sort of elevation of the importance of principles? Can that coexist with also? recognizing and elevating the importance of teachers because some, you know, sometimes I wonder, um, and I don't know what percentage, but some amount of teachers and just anybody with a management above them is like, ah, management, they don't do anything. So can we have the conversation, the nuanced conversation where like, yes, principles are very important, but guess what? School leadership and principals are also very important. Yeah. They do a different job, but are also ex- extremely and exceedingly important. Do you think it's possible to have that conversation and not have people, you know, I'm, I guess I'm specifically thinking about teachers writ large, kind of be super defensive and be like, no, no, we're the ones that work with kids. We're the ones that do this. Is that possible? I think there's always a, a, an element of what do, what do they do from wherever position you're, you're in. Sure. When you're in a teacher teacher position, you're like, what does the department chair do? They get that extra period off or extra whatever. What do they do with that extra time? But then when you're in that position, you're like, well, I'm I'm observing teachers. I'm working very hard. And then maybe that same person is like, well, what does the assistant principal do? I think that's the nature of the hierarchy of, of an organization that has folks in charge of others. Uh, I don't know if it answers – it doesn't necessarily answer your question, but I think it's just present. And how, right. as, a, as a leader, how do you – how do you – you don't – you're not – you shouldn't be actively trying to refute that. Because you know that it's there, it's it's it should be shown in your actions and the way that you lead your teachers, mm-hmm. um, that you're doing the work and you're trying to support them in the best way that you can. Yeah. The thing the thing that I'm fascinated by um, is how you support principals, in especially in these high stress environments where you've got to make a lot of progress quick, and. Um, how much autonomy do you give principals? Do you let them really kind of do their own thing and develop their own little fiefdom uh, outside the bounds of this, what the school system expects? Or do you want everybody doing the same thing? Like Betsy DeVos says, there's no system. Um, so it's always that push and pull of, of autonomy versus kind of conforming. And he I, I think there he needs to really be sight. Th- no, he doesn't say. No, because I because mean, he doesn't know. Well, he, I mean, I, the the hiring thing it sounds like is one. Okay. You know, where but they that's, get to hire that, that's a that's right. A, but then yeah, that's I mean, an easy one. Right. Hiring is an easy fix. Yeah. But beyond beyond that, there's no you know no. concrete examples in here. But I think if you if you're going to allow autonomy for principals, they know their school better than anybody else. I think there needs to be some sort of conformity to the system, what in whatever system you're in. But there also needs to be some 
flexibility for principals to innovate Agreed. and Agreed. allow their teachers to experiment and yep. and allow themselves to experiment with things that may not go well, but you need to try it and you need to do different things because so whatever's happening might not be working. It's fine in that sweet spot. Yeah. Yep. All right, so the article is in The Atlantic. Once again, it's titled, I used to preach the gospel of education reform, then I became mayor. Policymakers need to question their assumptions about what makes a good school. I just want to leave you guys with... I'll pop it into the show notes. Pop it into the show oh, notes. Oh, you know what I wanted to say? One last thing. Okay, shoot. I think the biggest success of of Rom's uh, program... Dead, dead fish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as, as mayor and in charge of the school system was Rom's Reader's. Rob's Readers was strong. Such a good program. Yeah. Uh, we, we Can you can... imagine the ego that would take for be like, let's, hey, guys, I have a really great idea for a program. <laughs> Listen. It's just about alliteration. It has nothing R- to Rob, do with itself. R- Robbie's, so I, Robbie's I wanna, Readers. I want to start a reading program for kids. Well, we right? got Casey's Cash Cab. <laughs> you created that. <laughs> okay. I didn't create it. Okay. <laughs> you planted the seeds. So, so <laughs> Rom's re- let's call it Rom's Readers. That is the most <laughs> egotistical thing. I know. So all schools are going to do it now. We're going to call it Rom's Readers. Well, nobody's ever accused Ron of, Rom of being humble. <laughs> that is very true. Very true. But like, come up with something different. <laughs> yeah. It, it was. It's an interesting piece because i do think he does stumble upon this principal thing i think i think i think in the future it should play a bigger role the the last thing i'll leave you with is did you see the quote from dr reardon who we really liked his we really liked his research uh rom leaves us with after studying what's happened in chicago the stanford education professor sean reardon declared quote these trends are important not only for students in chicago but for those in other large districts because they provide an existence of proof that it is possible for large urban districts to produce rapid and substantial learning gains etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah yeah so it's and they and they did and they did make gains they did absolutely yeah. some some other time i want to get into this concept of charter versus public he says it needs to be reframed it's misguided, as he said as what Come on, quiz. How, um, how, how, oh, look. Uh, a focus on quality versus mediocrity. Look at you. <laughs> okay, yeah. So yeah. that'll be our next discussion. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. Right, boys? That's right. All with right. our interview with Dr. Sophia. Oh, I'm so excited. All right, fellas, we are incredibly excited to welcome Mr. John Safir to Ed's Not Dead. John is the founder and president of Research for Better Teaching, also known as RBT, a professional development organization dedicated since 1979 to improving classroom teaching and school leadership throughout the United States and internationally. He's led large-scale district improvement projects, forging working alliances among superintendents, teacher union leaders, school boards, in places such as Montgomery County, Maryland, Eugene, Oregon, and Brockton, Revere, and Attleboro in Massachusetts. He's an author of eight books on education, including a book that's had a big impact on us, The Skillful Teacher, now in its seventh edition and used extensively in teacher and leader training programs in districts and leading institutions of higher education. Other publications include How to Bring Vision to School Improvement and John Adams' Promise. John Safir, we are incredibly excited to have you on the show. Welcome to Ed's Not Dead. Well, thank you, Robbie. That's a very nice welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are we are humbled and, and gratified to have you. So let's jump right in. You ready? Sure. All Fire right. Away. All right. So let's get current. Recently, you've been working on developing something called the High Expertise Teaching Project. Yeah, we, right. we, we want to know more about it. Can you explain a little bit to our audience about what it yeah. is, what it is sure. and what it's intended to do? Um, well, it's based on a few a few propositions. Uh, the first proposition is the uh, one that's been much talked about the last 25 years. There are a lot of variables that are important for having good schools for kids, but amongst all those variables, the most important one is the teacher, what that person knows and believes and can do. Uh, and... Um, you know, that's been the missing element in ed reform. There's a little graphic I put up sometimes, which is a, a, like a, a 45-second capsule of the last 50 years of ed reform. And, and, it, and it shows that in the 70s and the 80s, we were focused on curriculum, packages, programs. And, and then in, in, the, um, in the 90s, it was on structures. Let's have small high schools. Let's have parent involvement. Let's have 
uh, decision making that involves families. Let's have student advisories. And in the in the two thousands, it was the standards movement. You know, we can't have fifty states with fifty different standards for what's for proficiency supposed to be. And then in, uh, in the current decade, we uh, entered the era of data, 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 data all the time. And the the point is that all of those were worthwhile, and all of them are needed, but what's been missing is the thing that would catalyze them all and make them work better, a focus on the people who are in front of the children every day and bringing every one of us uh, into the zone of high expertise teaching. So... Um, that's the first proposition, you know. It's in, in, in whatever years I have left, I'm going to try and reach policymakers with that message, and then some of the things we figured out about how to get more of it, my expertise teaching, for more kids in more classrooms more of the time. That's great. Thank you. So the first, the first step in the, the high expertise teaching theory of action is hiring, and I, I, I know for a fact we've all sat around and, and hired people that we thought were going to be great, and for whatever reason, it didn't turn out. Um, so what are some of those best practices or questions that allow principals and teacher leaders to like truly understand who they're hiring to make sure that mm-hmm. they, they, even if they are not now a high expert teacher, teacher how can they become one? Well, after I um, warm up <laughs> to answer that question, <laughs> I think you'll understand why it's a five to seven year project if any district undertakes it. So we'll, we, I'm going to wind up with hiring, all right. But the, the main thing is is we have to get uh, people in our own profession and then the voting public to understand that the knowledge and skill to teach really well is huge and complex beyond what that voting public realizes and far beyond what our personnel pipeline gets people access to. And the uh, the poignant thing for me is we know what's in that knowledge base, uh, and, and here's where it here's where it gets intimidating. It includes anything a person knows how to do that impacts the probability of intended learning. Anything, you know. So if I call up a family and, and I give them a good news message, or if I on back to school night I sit down with the families and instead of telling them everything I'm going to do, I ask them to tell me what they want for their child. Um, you know, that's a part of skillful uh, teaching in the knowledge base. If, yeah. if, I, if I sit down with the quiz I gave the kids today and I do error analysis to figure out what's gone wrong with the eight kids that missed number four and I design reteaching about it, you can't even see that in an observation. But knowing how to do that is an important part of skillful teaching, just like being a good team member is. Yeah. So... Um, one of the things that's most important in the knowledge base, which, which you all have, have run across from some of the work of the Center for Skillful Teaching, is I believe ability can be grown. In, in, in the courses you might have taken, we call that effort-based ability. Right. Meaning, yeah, the ability to do something it can be increased by effort. Now, I want every teacher in my district to believe that, and there's no way we're going to collapse the achievement gap unless people not only believe that, but act out of it, which means I'm going to exert myself to make the low-performing, low-confidence kids in seventh grade change their mind about themselves. You know, some of these kids have received messages their whole lives, maybe from the society around them because they're a child of color, maybe from their family who says, well, none of us have ever been any good at math, John. Well, I mean, don't worry. Don't expect it. You'll be, you'll be fine. Whatever the <laughs> circumstances are, there are a lot of kids who give up on thinking school has something for them and they can do well. We can change their mind. We know what to do to do that. Mm-hmm. We know what it looks like and sounds like in considerable detail. Uh, that's an element of high expectations teaching. Right. Now, back to your question. What am I going <laughs> to do in the hiring process to figure that out? Well, the first thing is I'm going to have them do a demo lesson, oh, which... Yeah. Most places do. I'm going to see how they treat the kids. I'm going to see what they do when a kid gets an answer wrong or half right. Do they know how to do persevere and return? You know, the kid gets the answer half right. Hey, John, what's, a, what's, what's natural resources? You remember that definition? And I say, well, um, you know, it's like bark and trees. And so the, the high expectation teacher says, I like that you're using examples. Now there's one part you've left out. Well, kid can't figure it out. So teacher says, okay, you call on somebody to add the piece. Kid does it a couple of rounds to get it all there. Then she goes back to the kid. 
And she says, okay, Ricardo, can you put it all together now? And he says, the missing part that a kid supply. Oh, it's, uh, you know, it's something you find in nature. And he stops and she says, okay, but you're, you're missing the cool part you had before. Oh, something you find in nature and can use like bark and trees. Mm. Now, nice. so we're observing for what a person would do in order to build kids confidence rather than get, get it answered fast and move on. Uh, the other thing I would do is there's, a, there's an interview that Martin Haberman created years ago, and it's, it's training for people on how to find out if you believe in your heart it's your job to get the kids to succeed and believe they could if they had confidence and good strategies. And in that interview protocol, it isn't the questions you ask, it's how you follow up on the first answer the teacher gave. Mm -hmm. So I would give everybody some, um, some training in, in how, to, how to do that. And I guess the last thing is, uh, it depends on what your resources are, but I, I wouldn't just call up the people that the uh, person recommended. I would call them up, but I'd call up somebody else who worked closely with them who might know something about them. Um, anyway, what I want to get out in hiring, I want to get out the, uh, the belief and the what would you do if questions that identify the attitude towards growing ability. And I think uh, w one of the things that you mentioned uh, in the email to us, uh, you, you sent us a graphic that really struck, struck me and connects to what you're saying is what people think it takes, and I think what brand new teachers think it takes sometimes to be an effective yeah. teacher. You, you talk about content knowledge, being literate, being smart, being intelligent, and then everything else, and then all the skills that are required in there. I just want to list them because I thought it was just, an, it really, it, it's interesting the things you don't think about in terms of effective teaching, family, community relations, cultural proficiency, data analysis, team collaboration skills, planning, motivation, instruction, management, technology, content-specific pedagogy, content analysis skills, all these things that mm -hmm. we lot. take for granted in, yeah. in what it takes to be an effective teacher. And, and I, I want to use that as a springboard to, to zoom out to where we're getting teachers from. So we're talking mm -hmm. about um, teacher preparation programs. With your framework <clears throat> of this, of this um, high expertise model, Mm -hmm. What should teacher prep programs, what should they be doing differently based on what you've seen? Because um, it seems like as a system, a lot of systems are reactive in their approach. How, how can we be proactive and how can post-secondary institutions be proactive? Well, I think that the, um, there are some skills that are teachable in college because they're head work. Now, if you teach me how to analyze content like there's, there's, as far as I can tell, there's like 21 sequential concepts that go into really understanding what fractions are. So if, if you have me study for the area I'm going to be teaching, mm -hmm. what the relationship of concepts is to one another, that's concept analysis. Right. And then figure out by giving me samples of student work what kind of errors they might have been made. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that's quite intellectual, and you could do that in college. You can't teach a person classroom management in college. Because you don't have the kids yet. Right. Uh, <laughs> you need them to, yeah. to, 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 to sure misbehave. Do. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I, I, another... I mean, you make a, a really good point. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like, I, I think that that seems to be missing. And, and I feel like there are a lot of folks that come into the teaching profession that have a really misunderstanding. They, they don't have an understanding or a clear concept of what it's like to be in a school and to work as a teacher. They have an idea of what it's like to be a student and what they liked mm -hmm. or didn't like. Um, they, right. have a, they have this nostalgic view of maybe a, a history teacher they had who had great stories, um, but I feel like there's, there's a lot of that that's missing. You bet. Um, you know, the, the ads you see on television that are attempting to... Um, compliment teachers are all about charisma and inspiration yeah yeah <laughs> nothing wrong with that you know but what about the expertise it takes to make the 1300 decisions you make every day um i would like to get a, a um i would like to get uh, gates to 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 give the four of us a million dollars to make a series of clips that show the subtlety of decision making during the flow of this incredible complex human environment that a classroom. I mean, I, there isn't any profession that demands as much of a person. You know? we'll, we'll call, when, we, when I call Bill, 
Um, well, I'll put you on that check. Yes, and, and if Bill isn't available, go for Warren. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'll go with that. I'm also just like, envis- as you said it, I'm envisioning taping a classroom and then like watching the teacher and then just like stopping every three seconds with right. a thought bubble of whatever the decision and choice right. that the teacher has to make and right. then two seconds and the next choice they have to make, the next choice. And like, that would be fascinating. When, when, when John, when you were describing the, the way the teacher persevered and came back to Ricardo... I, yeah. I was thinking, <laughs> I'm not sure I was a- ever able to do what you just described. I mean, that is a, that's a pretty highly developed skill, isn't it? I mean, you don't just, you're not born with that. That's something you're, you, you think we could teach teachers, right? Yes. And it's absolutely teachable. And if you'd followed me around in my 10 years of classroom teaching, you wouldn't have seen me do it either. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> all right. That makes me feel a little less inadequate. Um, all right. So I, I have another question for you. I, because I think you've gotten to this when you mentioned Warren and, and Bill. Um, since I've been a principal, we've we've lived through the, the NCLB era and race to the top. And as you've uh, you developed these great programs to, to, to develop teachers, I, I've, I've coined this phrase that I call coercive accountability, which has mm. certainly have been around in, in my era as a principal. I, I'm... I'm curious about how you think can can this can the high expertise teaching project can it move us beyond that era that hopefully I think we're maybe leaving of 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 this kind of coercive accountability where teachers are are faulted for the ills of public education what's your thought on whether we're still there and and how we get out of it It absolutely can but I'm going to keep you in suspense for 15 seconds about why <laughs> Because I want to compliment the the idea of the, the tape of classroom, you put the thought bubble up. Who was saying that? Was that Casey? Oh, no, that was, that was Peter. That was, that was Crable. <laughs> yeah. That is right on. That yeah. is the way to do it. Yeah. That is, you got the blueprint there, you got the screenplay for these video clips, yeah. which would illustrate uh, the subtlety and complexity. All right, now back to getting out. <laughs> you, you made him very, he's got the smuggest look on his yeah. face, but go ahead. Go <laughs> Interview's ahead. over, I'll see yeah, you guys go later. Go ahead, John. Drop the mic. All right, anyway. Right. I think the, uh, we are ready to abandon uh, punishment, humiliation, and embarrassment without support for adult professional culture building. Okay. Now, here's what I mean by that. Any school that really moves their instruction forward has created an environment where it is safe to take risks. Nobody's going to dish you in the parking lot when the meeting is over if you didn't have as many kids uh, get the uh, do well on the quizzes the previous person and we can be vulnerable in front of one another mm-hmm. and there's a hunger for learning about this huge knowledge base I think those two go together you have to appreciate that the knowledge base is huge yeah. so you don't feel inferior if there's parts of it you don't know none of us none of us know it all so, but if, if I believe that it's a huge knowledge base mm-hmm. and it takes a whole career to learn uh, a, uh, enough to be called a high expertise person then I'm willing to say, you know what? Every one of us can get better. Now, some you 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 fellows may have been, or now be in a school where that is how the adults relate to one another. Mm-hmm. But it didn't happen by accident. Didn't get there by itself. It happened from the top down because the leader wanted to grow it right. and model. It. So there is a you know I, I've spent. Um, a lot of the last decade digging into this one. You know, I certainly don't know everything about good teaching, but I know enough to say, hey, there's a circle around that. You can get more of it for more people if they're in an environment that has a strong culture. Mm-hmm. So what do the leaders do to build it? Now, the, one, of, one of the things that you mentioned earlier in uh, one of your emails was what could the state government do uh, or the federal government do in order to help us move our profession forward. Yeah. They could focus on making leaders real leaders. Yeah. And, um, you know, that should include being really good at observing and knowing what's going on and whether it's effective and having an impact on the kids or not. But if you don't build this culture, it doesn't matter how good you are at other things. Um, people will clam up um, and in- interpret teacher evaluation as what the district thinks they're going to do to improve. And well, teacher evaluation is needed, all right, but we're not going to improve the expertise of our people uh, through teacher evaluation alone. 
in and amongst the dozen or so things that will help me get better, that isn't even one of the most powerful ones. So that's a long answer to no, your that's, question. No, that, 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 that's good. And you and you 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 dove you dove into the principal thing, which I think we're going to want to talk a little bit more about. Go ahead, Peter. Well, yeah, no, it's it's. A nice segue here, because before you came on, we discussed uh, an article. It's actually an op-ed by Rahm Emanuel, and talking about school reform and um, his own experiences now as the mayor of Chicago, and how the sort of epiphany that he had um, was, oh, we don't put enough time, effort uh, into developing principles and effective leaders. And so, yeah. I, you know, I was going to ask, well, you know, what do you think about that, and what's your opinion on it? But you, you answered it, which is great. Um, so I, I guess the next piece that you had gone into was talking about um, improving teaching. So I guess my question is, you know, looking at things that you've written, such as skillful teacher and now high expertise teaching, how do you know that it improves student outcomes and that it eliminates the achievement gap? And then the secondary question is, you know, does it help prevent those teachers from leaving the workforce in the first five years? Because there's nothing worse than putting in the time and the effort into developing someone you know, only to see them leave and all that human capital um, kind of walk away with it. Yeah, well, one of the best pieces of evidence is in your own district, Broadacres Elementary School. In the early 2000s, their achievement scores were in the tank. And at that time, the, um, the, um, the fire department remedy of coming in with the axes and cleaning out the place was mm-hmm. one of the ones that Maryland said you could do. Right. All right, let's just fire the whole faculty and rehire them all over again. And Jerry Wiest and Mark Simon put their heads together. Right. Mark, Mark never gets enough credit for his really important role in creating the professional growth system. That's just a P.S. You know, his name is mentioned a few times in the book that right. uh, Stacy Childers wrote. Uh, but, his, you know, we did all our training in the union headquarters, and he was absolutely a leading figure in the steering committee that Sandra Spooner and I would, would, uh, would facilitate. So anyway, Broadacres, Mark and Jerry says, no, 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 we're going to go with the people that we have. We'll just give them extra resources. And uh, so every teacher in that t- school took the uh, skill, studying skillful teaching course from Catherine Esme and I think Wade Copeland, 2002-2003. Now, that wasn't the only thing they did. They also had Jody, what's Jody? Jody, Jody Lalick, the late, great Jody Lalick. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Now, she was a culture builder. Yes, she was. And so and, put, and, a, and a ridiculously strong instructional leader. She trained me. I was terrified of her, but she was amazing. <laughs> ah, Go you ahead. got it. You put those two things together. Yeah. Let's study teaching together, and let's do it non-defensively. And bingo, you know, the school w- had incredible uh, gains. gains in student achievement. The um, The Education Trust website highlights 100 points of light, as it were, every year. Schools around the country where the, the deck is stacked against the kids because there's crime in the streets and drugs and broken families. And, and yet these schools... Uh, get outstanding uh, gains, yeah, and and it endures further on. Mm-hmm. Now, nobody has studied those schools to see if they had, if they studied teaching expertise together. Mm-hmm. But what what we do know is that when the principal leaves a school like that, it's liable to fade away. And I have in you know this is our fortieth year in existence at RBT. Mm-hmm. I've seen that happen again and again and again. Right. And that is why we're focused now on doing it system-wide. You've got to have a system for developing all of the principles, and it's teacher leaders, too. It's all of the people who, who have an instructional focus, instructional coaches, and make sure that they, when they get a job as a school leader, have the support for continually learning about that. And that, therefore, is something that I never w- was quite able to get inside enough in Montgomery County who supervises and coaches and develops the principal. Now, Robbie, you had that job as a principal, um, consulting principal, right? Yes. So that's a key group. Yes, it is. And the other people who are key, and now they're called directors, they used to be area superintendents. Yeah. Are the people who supervise the principals. Right. You know, it... it, it we were hired to develop the administrator evaluation system. Carolyn Tripp and I did that starting in 2003 and four, I think. Right. 
and we got this business of school culture written into the into the standards. Right. But we never got to do enough work on how would you know if a person was good at it. Right. And and more important, what are you doing as a director in your school visit to help them get better at it? Yeah, that's the that's the fifty thousand dollar question. I think that 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 work continues. Um, all right, so uh, John, are you are you ready to be put on the spot by the the local quiz show host here, <laughs> Mister Mister Casey Siddons? Well, can I get my Google side up? Real yes, fast? Yeah. yeah, get your phone I don't know out. If Google will help you. Maybe or, it will. Or Actually, your, it probably would. Or your laptop. And once again, don't don't if if it doesn't go well, we'll cut it out of the show. So so do your best. Uh, leave it in. Yeah. Leave it in. Okay. All right. Well, it's it's been a pleasure having you on, uh, John. We're so excited to have you. Um, with us and my wife's actually calling me right now. I apologize for that. Um, that one, we'll cut that out too. So it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. So we know that you are an absolute gem for the teaching profession. So we want to ask you, Mr. Safir, all that you know about the gemstone sapphire. Oh, that is good. So, you know, the beautiful diamond and sapphire necklace that was in Titanic right. that was thrown overboard, that thing. Uh, <laughs> I have three questions about this beautiful gem. If you can answer two out of the three correctly, you win a million dollars from Warren Buffett. Okay. <laughs> this is wait, wait, don't tell me. That's right. <laughs> See, you know. Thank goodness someone else listens. All right, go ahead. Ready? Number one. Yep. Sapphire is the second strongest natural gemstone after another famous and shiny rock. What is the only natural item that can scratch a sapphire? Is it A, granite, B, diamond, or C, the nonverbal stare and attention move of an effective teacher. <laughs> I'm really attracted to C, but I'm just going to go with B. All right, B is correct. Diamond. Oh, That's correct. Very nice. All right, he's got one. All right, number two. It is believed that sapphires can cure eye diseases and preserve what? Is it A, celibacy, <laughs> B, hard-boiled eggs, or C, that old super, that super old social studies teacher you had in high school who gave you nightmares? <laughs> Can I hear B again? B is hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> well, of course, that's the uh, and, and A was what was celibacy. A? <laughs> celibacy. In other words, it will preserve those three things. <laughs> it will yeah. preserve one of those three things. One of those three things. <laughs> How about D? None of the above. No, uh, sorry. <laughs> I think, all right, I think an ancient myth might be that it would preserve celibacy. A is correct. Oh, that look is at correct. that. Okay, so... All so, right, two so, out of... You so got two. Passed. We'll see if, see if he Number gets 100%. Number three, okay. you get 100%. It didn't work for me, and I gave up all my sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> three, because of the gem's hardness, sapphire has industrial uses. Which of the following items can you find sapphire within? Is it A, the Apple Watch, B, an Apple Slicer, oh. or C, a number two pencil? <laughs> I'll go for A. A is correct. The hey, Apple Watch, hey, the glass. Nice. Look at Mr. Safir. Three out of three. Hundred <laughs> percent. Now tell Warren there are strings attached. I will. I will tell him that there are many strings attached. <laughs> all, all right, all right, John. It's been great to have you on the show. Can you tell our listeners um, where they can find your most recent work, or where you'd like to point them? Uh, can they find you on social media, or what's what? Where where can John Safir be found these days? Uh, the uh, the skillful teacher book has a new chapter on uh, anti racism and cultural proficiency and the relationship of them and awesome. several other new chapters as well. You can get that from RBT. That's rbteach dot com. Okay. The high expectation teaching book uh, you can get there too. But I think they ought to go to the free downloads section of our website because there are articles about adult professional culture there. I'd really like to get around. Okay. All right. And any uh, uh, Twitter? Yes or no? Uh, I have started uh, posting okay. every week on LinkedIn, and it links to Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. Cool. Okay. Good. All right. Well, on behalf of the boys, um, John, thanks so much. It's been a true honor for Ed's Not Dead to have you on the show. We've been obviously heavily influenced by your work, so we're we're incredibly biased. But um, to 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 now have our podcast and be able to have you as a guest is a, is a is a great pleasure, and I know our listeners have gotten a lot out of it. So hopefully we can have you on again. I'd be delighted to. And thank you very much. This is a great way to end my evening. All right. I loved it. All right. Thanks, Th- thanks John. We'll talk to you soon. Right. Oh, bye-bye. Bye. I don't know about you guys, but 
That was one of the best interviews we've ever had. It was an excellent and interview. We've, and it was we've, so we've good. Had, we, I don't want to rank them. We've had so many good ones. But to have John Safir, who had a tremendous influence on all three of us on, oh my goodness. on Ed's Not Dead, is a, is a big deal. So I've been reading his stuff for for 10 years. Okay, so jump in. And working with his stuff. What, did, what, what, what struck you in the interview with what he talked about? Um... Here I'll, I'll go. I got go one. For it. Just, <laughs> apparently, I was. I thought I had it written down. But you were like so oh, ready. He's, he's looking at a blank piece of I, paper. He's been, he's he's been focused on it, his work it, for it, ten years. Okay, okay, okay. um, you know, it was the five to seven year s- timeline to develop highly effective teachers. Yeah, yeah. I think if that was maybe a little bit more clear to new teachers. Right, coming into the profession, that's right. like, it, it. I don't know if it, it doesn't make it any easier, you know, when you're like, man, this is really hard. But just I think the reassurance of this takes time, right? N- not two months, yeah. Not three months, yeah. This takes years and years and years to really get to the sweet spot, and you do need to be improving every year and learning more every year. But just looking at it um, from that r- sort of viewpoint of. Five to seven years is what you really have to give yourself. Right. Um, you know, I think that's pretty. And pretty then imagine if you don't have the conditions. Right. Or the culture. Right. All, the right. The all, the, the, I mean, all the other things he mentioned. Correct. That already make it in not perfect conditions, but really good conditions. Five to seven years. Yeah. Take away a lot of those. You know, maybe yeah. that's the re- all that. Yeah. Well, they that's why, they, that's they, why they leave. Teachers don't get there. No. Well, and I, I also think like I think it's a tough line to walk on when you're looking at. Um, if you have an ineffective teacher in a classroom, let's say in their first year, who's clearly ineffective and also unconsciously unskilled, that, that could be a recipe for for not a good climate for, for students. So how do you balance the difference between natural professional growth in a brand new teacher and right. that of an ineffective teacher? That is, I think that is a challenge for systems everywhere. Yeah. Um, if, it, if five to seven years yeah, is... You've got, you got to give people a chance, but you can't go on forever. Right. No, I no, I I realize that. I mean, there but, has to be quick. You you in your work, you you have to see teachers make progress quickly. And but yeah, am I missing you, your point? No, no, I, okay. I you're not missing my point. I'm just, I'm trying to be careful to, to <laughs> choosing not, my words to not step in it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I think it's we do have to give ourselves some slack and give teachers some slack in terms of there are natural learning curves in a profession that throws you in to the classroom just like a veteran. Um, But we also need to... There is an urgency that needs to be had for new teachers that for some is not there. Yeah. All right, so quiz. Yes. You know as the geezer on the show that I love educational history, right? (laughs) I wrote it down, too. Oh, darn, so don't look. Me, too. Don't look. Me, too. Okay, so 70s and 80s were what? Just, just looking at it, it's embarrassing. Curriculum. <laughs> and? Standards. Programs. No, no programs. Yeah. Curriculum and programs. 90s. Structures. Structures. Very good. Early 2000s. Standards. Awesome. Uh, current, 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 current climate. Data. Data. Very good. Yeah. So, um, as you know. That was a very great oh, synopsis yeah. of was, the history yeah. of education reform yeah. in the last 40 yeah. years. The only thing I would have thrown in, I would have thrown 60s into curriculum also. Mm. He, he didn't go back that far, though. Yeah. I also really wanted to ask him about um, who inspired him. I'm always fascinated by he's created such a body of work. Who, who, who got him going? Who, Where does it who, come from? Yeah, yeah. Who were his mentors? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he's an he's an amazing guy, but I I was just struck by the 1990s because you guys know that I did my dissertation on restructuring middle schools and how you can restructure organizations to to produce more effective outcomes. And it's funny that 90s era is when I came of age as an educator, right. and 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 it certainly had an influence on yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was also uh, I've also always been struck by how systematic he is about breaking down teacher behaviors. I mean, he thinks about everything related to what teachers do. It, he, 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 he can break it down into steps that have names. Right. I mean, who else has labeled what the moves that teachers make like John Saphir? Yeah. 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 I mean, I he, think, I think he, he got a good laugh out of my, my use of the nonverbal oh, yeah. move. That was outstanding. <laughs> what in the quiz? Yeah. Yeah. That was so good. I, I think, uh, 
I, I would like to know and like to talk to, to him about more about the post-secondary world. Now, I've been out of it for 10, 12 years, but like, I, I don't know that much has changed in those 12 years right. in, in the post-secondary world of teacher preparation programs. I don't know that it's changed. I don't think it has, but maybe it has. But I mean, the, that graph that I was talking about of all the things that it takes to be a teacher, to what extent are teachers being um, taught the, these things or can they be taught? And I think there needs to be some sort of revisiting of this at the post-secondary world. Well, he did give the example of fractions. For example, if you're going to teach fourth grade and you're going to teach fractions, you could sit down and, and, and really categorize the 20 skills that kids need to be yeah. effective at fractions. No, I, I totally understand. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I the think, content is, yeah. the content can be, Mastered over it was, time. It was the all the other stuff. All I the think, other stuff on, the, yeah. on his graphic. People, the eight other things. That but I think, yeah, but other, I think, people but, come into the profession and they're they want to be a history teacher and they learn history first. And that's what I did. I yeah. I, I learned history yeah, you got and somewhere. right. And then I knew a lot of my friends who started out as history teachers candidates, but then dropped out when they realized that they had to have a three point grade point average. But isn't isn't that argument really kind of like? what middle school should do to get kids ready for high school. I mean, it just sounds to me like teacher prep programs do a certain thing, but then they pass the baton to school systems who are then supposed to do something else. No, I'm, I, I'm, I guess my point is, I feel like you're being critical of teacher prep programs. I am being critical. I think, and I think they, they do a lackluster job and there's no accountability. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there is. I got it. Yeah. Did I get him there? There, there, we go. Go. <laughs> there is, there is little accountability at the post-secondary world for really anything. <laughs> and <laughs> but okay, what? How many? How many national? I, ha- I federal education reforms have actually impacted post secondary. I, I went through a very good teacher preparation program. I mean, I, I'm biased. I thought my, I, did, I did too. I, I, thought, I did too. I did too. But I'm saying that it can be that that's that. Those are two snapshots. I think it could have been better. I think there are a lot of things that I wish I learned and could have done that could have prepared me more. I I, I did zero data analysis. I learned very little about proficiency, cultural proficiency. Yeah. We learned how to well, plan. Those are we had all, a classroom management class. To be class. fair, those are all we much more specific. recent movements. Yeah. According to John Sophia, the 2010s are data. So yeah. a lot of that data analysis you're didn't really You're getting up there, out. buddy. You're, in your, you're solidly no, in you're, your 30s. I understand that. I understand that. But data analysis is, has been part of the skillful teacher repertoire forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cultural proficiency is not just a new thing for no, it's not. teachers to be paying attention to. No, my, my, um, my, equity is not a new thing. But if, if, if we're being serious about what we're bringing in and, and who we're hiring, we can't just continue to go at a reactive pace and hope that we can just rebuild teachers and in, in how we want them to be as teachers. And I, and I do think that the conversation bears worth having of, you know, any job has on the job training, you know, no, absolutely. Agree. No, no absolutely. university is going to prepare you hundred percent for no. anything, right. but you know, it is, it, it is a matter of finding that balance between the school. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The university prepares you with this and then the school, the workplace right. takes over in teaches right. you the no, rest. I, I, and, there is workplace skills that obviously on the job training that needs to be had. However, if you apply for a teacher teacher program, the chances of you getting into it are are pretty high in America. If you want to get into a, a teacher prep program, you're going to get into it. Whereas in places like Finland and and other countries in the world, there is it's a very selective, a much more selective process, a process I mean, by which that I don't think I would have been able to get in as a teacher candidate. I, I know, but then you're. You wouldn't have been a teacher, and you you were a heck of a teacher. I, I yeah, and I, I realize mean, that's that, that now. McKin- that's that McKinsey report we talked about in year one. That's but that's not the same thing. That's not what we're talking about. You're talking about that the programs aren't aren't strong enough. Right. Okay. You you're t- the other point is that they should be more selective and only let in people that achieve at really high levels. And the only thing that gives me pause on that one is because of my own example, where I I feel like I became a pretty good teacher and. I don't know that I would have been. I wasn't even accepted into the program when I first started at my college. But part of your part of what motivated you after you got into the profession was how challenging it was for you right out of the gate. I know yeah, that for yeah. a fact, right? And so that there's nothing wrong with that. I yeah. mean, it's like it's like a first year quarterback in the NFL. Sure, they were great in college, but the the speed of the game is faster. The players are bigger. It's hard. It's harder. It, it is very and, hard, and you have to learn. But it, but if I get to student teaching at my fourth year in college, where I've spent all this money, right? And I get to student teaching when when the rubber hits the road, right? And I don't make it. Which, by the way, at least in my program, 
mm, everybody made it. Yeah. And everybody passed standard. Yeah. Um, or met standard. Well, most, my, te- most teachers meet standard across the United States in their evaluations. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, but th- there's, no, there's no impetus and there's no... It would be too disruptive to say that people are not meeting standard unless they're doing something egregious as a student teacher. Well, maybe anyway, it's a putting, longer conversation. Yeah, I, yeah. I know that I opened it. Would, it would have been worms, great but. if John had said, um, and I wouldn't have been surprised if he had said, what teacher prep programs need to do is use my book. And, <laughs> yeah, and, okay. I mean, yeah. and that would be good. Yeah. Because I do It is think, a multi-year process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've often thought, wouldn't it be really cool to use a version of Skillful Teacher in high school child development courses? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you know yeah. you know how I feel that it would be awesome to take expert teachers, mm-hmm. have them teach some version of that mm-hmm. to, to to kids that want to be teachers. I mean, that would be terrific. Okay, we got to get out of here. You're Crable's telling me we're up against the, the wall. You're we're up the against a break. Sorry. All right, that was awesome. Thanks, John Safir. We appreciate it. Um, uh, teacher yeah. teacher prep programs are terrible. We'll be right back. <laughs> Don't go away. Welcome back, folks, to episode 10 of Ed's Not Dead. It is that time of the show, everybody's favorite time. No, it is not Dear Betsy. It is Casey's Cash Cab. I do have some good news about Betsy, Dear Betsy. Okay. She donated her salary this year to a bunch of historically black colleges and universities. That's cool. Yeah, and a bunch of charities. How much does she make? About 200 grand. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so... This, Am, is, this Am, is called the, so, Amway and Blackwater pay for the rest. Of I know she's doing fine. <laughs> yeah, she, she's doing her okay. eight other yachts are fine. Um, <laughs> All right. Let's so go. Uh, last time we did a red light challenge, like and, in Cash Cab, and I won big time. And you did. This is big a time. blue light challenge. Okay. As you know, the Democratic nomination process for 2020 is well underway. Oh, it's painful. I'm running for president. <laughs> Just wanted you to know. <laughs> only only ten more months. <laughs> yeah. So we know who's running. Okay. Right. We have Cory Booker. Yep. Pete Buttigieg, yep. Julian Castro, John Delaney, Tulsi Gabbard, Kirsten Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, um, Elizabeth Warren, someone named Williamson, last name Williamson, <laughs> don't know who that is, and someone with the last name of Yang. Didn't what, know if you knew those. But what, what about Schultz? Is he running as an independent? Independent, okay. maybe. Okay. And uh, so the, the 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 red light, the blue light challenge this is, is not political, is it? We're not supposed to be doing political. No, what stuff. you have to do, okay. you have one minute, both of you, to name those who are either all but certain, likely to run, or might run. Oh, and, geez. <laughs> How am I supposed to remember who these people are? All right. You ready? Of people Tell that... Me. What do you mean? Have you watched the news? People that might run, likely run? All right. Okay. Tell me when to go. All right. Ready? I got so, one. So one minute. Ready? Yes. Okay. Hold on. Three, two, go. Elizabeth Warren. I, think I already said it. Joe Biden. Ding. That was the one I could get. Um, Gavin Newsom. No? Nope. Uh, Beto O'Rourke. Ding. Stacey Abrams. Nope. What? She's going to run. Andrew Gillum. Uh, nope. Stacey Abrams, Georgia? Yeah. Larry Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that that's possible it for counts. the Republican yeah. side. 30 there seconds. Uh, Sherrod or Sherrod Brown. Ding. What? I'm going to kill. Man. Um, somebody from Michigan. Uh, who else? <laughs> Kelly Phillips is going to listen to this. <laughs> <segment. laughs> <Just think I'm laughs> <pathetic. laughs> She's like, all right, give you a hint. Colorado. Oh, Hickenlooper. Ding. Oh, man. Montana. Tester? Tester. Nope. Yeah, I don't know. That He's going else. back to his farm. He's going to get voted out of that. <laughs> How about uh, New York City? Bloomberg. Oh, yeah. Ding. Yeah, he's in yeah. there. Cuomo. Nope. Darn. Uh, that is the time. Mark Warner. Man, am I the oh, only yeah, one that Kramer. pays attention to to the political junkies? How many more, how many more were there? Yeah, you did what you did well. Kramer so got four. We got, you got Hickenlooper, yeah. Biden. You got Bloomberg. You got Sherrod Brown. So that's four. You got um, Sherrod, Sherrod Brown, really a Democrat? I mean, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a, O'Rourke. That's a stretch. You got O'Rourke. <laughs> you got O'Rourke. Um, but here's here's uh, likely to run another person, yeah. Bullock from Montana. Bullocks. Bullock. I think he's the governor. <laughs> oh, we Bullocks. got uh, Jay Inslee. Oh yes, I've heard of him. Um, Landrew from Louisiana. Oh yeah, Old Mitch. Mayor uh, McAuliffe. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Like might run. What about Warner? I said Warner. She he was on the she was on the list that he gave. Initially. Mark Warner was. Oh, that Warner. Jeff Merkley. Okay, Warner. Warner. Do you know Warner. Senator Merkley? No, I do no. not know Senator. And Merkley. unlikely to run, but maybe someone named Bennett. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Bill Bennett. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. <laughs> oh, there you go. Bill De Blasio. Bill. Uh, really? Eric Holder. Oh. And John Kerry. Oh. Yeah, John okay. Kerry. Oh. Those are all good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good. lot of people running for that president. That's a lot of people Mr. running. Mr. Krabs, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. You won. Thanks. Clearly, I am not <laughs> watching enough CNN. <laughs> well, it's coming up soon, so you better pay attention. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just how kidding. Much it's attention. I'm going to It's more than ten months away. <laughs> All right, that was good. Casey's cash cap. That was the blue light challenge. So, what does sure. um, what does Mr. Krabs win? Uh, a handshake. Oh, okay. Nice job. Okay. Very nice. Hero. And without, you know, <laughs> the tickle. Kid, the weirdest. The weird, the weird Casey handshake. Do I get like theme music during that? Can we put some? I theme can work music? on something. Okay, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again to John Safir. Uh, we were amazed to have him as a guest, right, guys? Yeah. He was incredible. Awesome. Good uh, get. Good get, Mr. Krabs. Booyah! Uh, I could listen to John Safir all day long. Yeah. And folks, don't miss it. We are going to have Charlotte Danielson soon, maybe on the next episode, episode 11. Yep. Possibly. Probably, I, I know, we'll see. I know you don't want me to commit to I know, I numbers. Know. We'll just have it makes to see. you uncomfortable. And then <laughs> Randy Weingarten yes. coming up soon. Yeah. It'll be that or flip flop. We'll, we'll have to figure it out. Okay. Uh, but very important people. Please follow us on Twitter at Ed's Not Dead PC. You can follow me at RW Dodd, Mr. Krabs at Peter Crable, and at CH Siddons. And you can certainly find our website, Ed's Not Dead. Dot what, com. Dot com. com. What else am I missing, guys? We're a full service educational consulting company. Facebook and leave us a please rate our show. Oh yeah, leave us some feedback. And and spread the word about Ed's Not Dead. And as always, we are brought to you by Pulp Education, a full service educational media company specializing in leadership instruction and twenty first century school reform. And Mr. Graves, what do you say here? And all other cool stuff. Yeah. Cool <laughs> education. General awesomeness. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. General awesomeness. Good vibes. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being fans of the show and spread the word about Ed's Not Dead. And we'll talk to you soon. Say, say bye, guys. Bye. bye. bye.